The UK is famed for its rolling countryside. A green and iconic land. But this apparently green land is in trouble. Major incidents have been declared. The flood siren has sounded 40 again. 40 days without rain. This is a severe drought. Yield reduction of about 50%. There's undoubtedly the feeling that it's either nature or it's food production, and never the twain shall meet. And, and I, I think it's the complete opposite of that. As climate change gets worse, as nature and biodiversity loss gets worse, those services that the ecological system provided us becomes sacrificed in a way that we then have to pay for. For farmers, the implications of this period have been devastating. Most people would say that when they were younger, when you drove any distance in a car, you would find at the end of your journey that your windscreen was covered in tiny, dead, splattered insects. And that just doesn't happen anymore. What's happened in the, in, in the 20th century in agriculture is that we've developed a whole load of chemistry, chemicals that kill insects, insecticides and pesticides. The use of pesticides and fertilizers has become so routine that their damage to our soils, waterways, and nature as a whole has not been recognized. Since 2004, insect abundance in the UK has dropped by 64%. Three quarters of all the major food crops rely on pollinators to some extent. 603 million pounds per year comes from the contribution of pollinators to the value of the food that we produce here. If we ignore the role of invertebrates like pollinators and, and predatory insects in our ecosystems, we become much less able to produce food. It's an extremely important service that we, we uh, ignore at our peril. It isn't just insects. Everything we need for food production and our survival relies on there being an abundance of nature. Biodiversity is the foundation of life. The food we eat, the water we drink, the air we breathe, the carbon storage we need. Nature is underpinning pretty much every aspect of our society, economy, and indeed civilization. But the reality is that actually we're one of the most nature depleted countries in the world. If we restore nature, it will help us tackle some of our biggest challenges. Nature can catch and hold vast stores of carbon and at the same time can be reducing the risk of flooding, can be reducing the risk of heat waves and sustaining agriculture. If we are to navigate the effects of climate change, to maintain food and water security, if we're going to protect public health and well-being, then we don't have enough nature to do that anymore. There's one major reason for this. Our food system is by far the biggest cause of destruction of the environment. It's the biggest cause of deforestation. It's the biggest cause of the collapse of biodiversity of wildlife. It's the biggest cause of fresh water stress and fresh water scarcity. And it's the biggest cause of the collapse of aquatic life in our oceans. It's also, with energy, the second biggest cause of climate change. If we don't change our food system, our unsustainable food system, we won't be able to feed ourselves in the future. After the Second World War, there were 2.5 billion people on the planet. The population was projected to grow to 8 billion. And one of the biggest concerns people had at the time was that we wouldn't be able to feed ourselves. The Green Revolution intervened. And this was a way of farming which took high-yielding forms of wheat and rice and maize, combined them with nitrogen fertilizers, pesticides, and new methods of irrigation that meant that we could feed those 8 billion people off the same amount of land that used to feed 2.5 billion people, and in fact, produce almost twice the number of calories per person on the planet. 
We'd obviously been through the war. We'd seen really severe food shortages. Food production was key. So we had to drain fields to grow good crops. The small fields were made larger. Hedges were lost. Some woodlands were taken out. I think it was the government's policy of grants for drainage, grants for hedgerow removal. That was the encouragement. What's strange is there was no environmental criteria. I went to agricultural college and the word conservation was never mentioned. We were sent out as young farmers to bring every square meter of land into production. That's how it was at that time. What we now realize is that in creating those huge yields, we have driven nature off the land and we have crashed our ecosystems. I can remember as a little boy, the biodiversity on farms was just amazing. You'd see flocks of starlings, sparrows everywhere. The bird life was out of this world compared to today. We have unwittingly made farmers the villain in this story. All they were doing was doing what the state required of them. 71% of the UK is farmland, rising to almost 90% in Wales. But much of that isn't even directly feeding us. It's impossible to talk about industrial farming without talking about meat. 85% of the land that we use to feed the UK is used either to graze ruminants or to grow food to feed to animals, to feed us. Only a fraction of our farmland is used to grow pulses, grains, fruits and vegetables for us to eat. Despite taking up so much land, livestock produces just 32% of our calories. We do not need to be growing that much meat. It is an unbelievably inefficient way to feed ourselves. And that really is the single biggest problem. We need some of that land back, not only to produce food, restore biodiversity, but also to sequester carbon. This doesn't happen without our farmers. They're the people who understand this land. They're the people we need to incense to do the right thing. The farming practices of the old Green Revolution solved the food problems of the 20th century, but are not suited to the urgent climate and nature loss crises of the 21st century. We now need a new Green Revolution, where food production works with nature. Government and business support are critical in allowing farmers to achieve this. You can create a farming system that balances wildlife with crop production. Farmers across the UK have been moving to regenerative production methods. In Suffolk, the Barker family are working hard to farm with nature restoring water catchments to protect against drought, reducing ploughing to improve soil health, encouraging predatory insects to help negate the need for pesticides, and returning more than 10% of their land to nature while still making a profit. I always say to people, farm like an environmentalist, and manage the natural environment like a farmer. And by that, what I mean is we should be creating a farm environment that benefits all our pollinating insects and our beneficial predatory insects. We haven't sprayed an insecticide for four years on this farm. And, and of course, in the 70s, that would have been unheard of. It's good for our bank balance, it's good for our carbon footprint, and it's good for the natural environment and our farmland wildlife. We need a support system for agriculture, which recognises the fact that farmers have to work hard and produce areas rich in wildlife, and there is a cost to that. It can't come without some level of government funding. So we have got a situation at the moment where public money is driving 
change in our landscape, and it's not always change for the good. Of the £3.3 billion currently directed towards farmers in the UK, just 11% encourages nature and climate-friendly farming. We need to move to a system that is incentivizing uh, farmers to manage the land in a certain way that focuses on production in terms of sequestering carbon in supporting biodiversity and providing flood defenses, not simply in metrics around food production. It's really important that we pay the farmers to look after nature in a way that reconnects these isolated pockets of natural habitat that we have left in the UK and brings them into a connected network that supports nature at a whole landscape scale. Whilst government payments can incentivize farmers to transition to more nature-friendly farming, international trade deals are threatening to undermine these efforts. Britain has struck its first trade deal since leaving the European Union, and it is with Australia. The cattle at Fenonai Farm are looked after by Ben Jones. Like many, he has worries about the government's latest trade deal and how he'll compete. The Australia trade deal is not actually a very good deal for the UK. It makes no sense to do trade deals that allow food that requires cruelty to animals or the destruction of the environment to lower the price of that food and allow that to come into this country and undercut our farmers. All you're doing is exporting those harms to somewhere we can't see them and at the same time destroying the livelihoods of many of our rural communities. The right trade deals can connect us and our farmers with the global food market but have allowed us to overlook a major problem with our own production. We already produce more than enough food to feed everyone in the world, we just don't distribute it very efficiently or very fairly. Food security is essential. But due to factors from business supply chain requirements to government policies, farmers are all too often forced to waste huge amounts of food. Each year in the UK, an estimated 6.9 billion meals worth of edible food never makes it off farms. That's 18.9 million wasted meals every day. A third of all food produced is wasted through the supply chain, and that is an enormous impact on the environment. It is absolutely essential that everybody in the food industry, right the way through the value chain, plays its part to substantially reduce food waste. The system is broken. If we halve our food waste, increase crop yields by 15%, and reduce meat consumption by 30%, we could feed the UK on 30% less land, creating space for nature to recover to help future-proof against climate change. We've got a leading role to play in demonstrating how you can be really pro-nature, but also produce some amazing food. To help reduce food waste, businesses need to ensure their policies and practices aren't driving waste, whilst ensuring farmers are connected with markets that can use this food, for example, in vegetarian pre-prepared meals, for which there's a growing demand. If you look at ready meals, for example, already one in five of the ready meals we eat is vegetarian. I think one of the most exciting things at the moment is the consumer is waking up to the power that they have. I'm constantly saying to businesses, if you are not planning to reduce your impact on this planet, then you don't know it yet, but you're already in trouble because the consumer is going to want to really clearly understand when they buy from you what lies behind that. One in three people in the UK shops with us and we know that their excitement and their agitation for progress on nature, for progress on climate change is huge. What we need right now is businesses who get the importance of nature's recovery, get the importance of climate change, 
to stand up, take action now. And that's where we're going to make a positive difference. To move towards more nature positive and carbon negative practices, it's vital that all farmers have access to the right financial support and advice. We're one of the largest lenders to agriculture in the UK. It's almost 19% of the carbon emissions on my balance sheet of my lending and only 2% of my lending. We support over 40,000 farmers up and down the UK. If I want to halve my emissions, I'm not going to stop lending to agriculture. So I now need to develop, having measured it, how do we help make a transition that is supportable, sustainable for the future, that allows us to reduce our emissions, but in a just and fair way. The solution is twofold. Improving our current farming system, whilst investing in new opportunities. Farmers are generally hugely entrepreneurial in, in their approach. They're huge adopters of renewable energy and renewable sources. Innovation is providing new ways to produce food. Solar-powered vertical production. Regenerative ocean farming. Insects recycling food waste. And precision fermentation producing new protein sources all have the potential to relieve pressure on land. But to reach net zero and restore nature, investment must reach all our farming systems. One of our regenerative farming projects, when it was assessed, was sequestering 10 times more carbon than it's emitting. And that's a huge contrast because our agricultural sector in the UK is responsible for something like 10% of our emissions. I think financial institutions need to be thinking long term about how they're supporting farmers in transition because ultimately the success of their investment and the value of the underlying asset in the land will be better supported if the soil is sequestering more carbon and the biodiversity on the farm is healthier. One of the things that will have the biggest impact both on nature and on climate change is how we use our land. There are ways of producing beef which are extremely bad for the environment and bad for nature and, and, and bad for animal welfare. But there's also ways to produce beef which are brilliant for all of those things. And we feel that we're doing that here. Neil, who farms in the Yorkshire Dales, was one of several farmers to take part in a pioneering project aimed at repairing the damage done from decades of overgrazing by replacing some of his sheep with native breed cattle. They live outside all year round. That winter grazing is absolutely critical to preparing the land for the flowers to come in the spring. By producing meat less intensively, Neil has been able to farm much more in balance with nature. We treat them in a way where they are just part of the wildlife. So there's calves being born out on the hill at the moment and there's leverets among them and there's curlew chicks among them and they're just an extension of that wildlife. So there's quite often the assumption that meat produced in this way has to be more expensive, but that doesn't necessarily have to be the case. Maybe you just eat less meat, higher quality meat, but we just use less of it. If we go back to 2012, when we were, we were still using certain production methods, we know that we were emitting around about 220 tonnes of carbon every year throughout our farming process. In the more recent figures, that's actually come down to minus 94. So we know now that we are a net carbon sink. The more we put nature at the forefront of what we did, we realized that the profitability of the farm improved as well. If we get the food system right, and we have a massive opportunity to do this right now, we could really set things up well for the future. The ways we use land to produce food must be reformed to meet our urgent climate and nature commitments. 
With the correct support, all farmers can drive this new green revolution. It is possible to have a farming system that balances wildlife alongside food production. From my perspective, I think it's really important that food retailers look for different methods of production that are better for the environment, better for nature. We must design nature back into the farming system to ensure farms remain profitable as they tackle one of the most important challenges of the 21st century, the devastating consequences of a changing climate. We're now literally at five minutes to midnight. Now is the time to take an integrated approach whereby nature recovery migrates to the center of economic thinking. Nature has been exploited, not valued, not costed. Nature doesn't exist in any of the systems that we use to value human success. And until we start building nature into our calculations of what makes a successful farming system, we can't be surprised if farming continues to destroy nature. The only sustainable way forward for us as a business, indeed I would argue for any business, is to be nature positive, because without being nature positive, ultimately, you can't be profit positive. There's tremendous opportunity in this. We've seen it with Net Zero. A whole industry has blossomed. We now need to see the same thing happen with nature. At the end of the Second World War, we've been asked to be farmer heroes with regards to food security. Maybe now we've been asked to be farmer heroes again with regards to climate change and to nature's recovery. And I firmly believe that we can do that.